Matt, it happened. What's up? I found a detent laying around, so that means I had to put another build together. <laughs> of course, man. I'm, you know how it goes. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really caught up on barrel. I found this one out in the warehouse, and I just figured I'm gonna go with this one. Oh, well, what kind of barrel is it? Not three in a blackout. No, but what kind of barrel is it? Uh, the kind that has projectiles running through it. It's, it, well, okay, fine, fine. It says uh, 4150CRMOV. I don't know what it means. I don't think it's important. That's pretty good. Maybe we should talk about barrels. Welcome back everybody, Clint to today with Classic Firearms. We've got Matt back with us today. What's up guys? Who's allowing me to be in this video. And Matt, you've recently been doing some videos where you're getting like into the nitty gritty of stuff. Yeah, details man, important stuff. <laughs> details are important. And one of those of which was like your MOA one. Mm -hmm. That one I thought was pretty cool. If you guys haven't seen that, check that out. That was just recent. Uh, but this one is to coincide or go along with a lot of our videos about barrels. Mm -hmm. We've been covering a lot because, well, if you're like me, you're always kind of like building or, you know, working on something. Gee, I wonder what this guy's gonna be. But uh, anyway, put that back on that. And uh, it recently came up when we talked about with Aero Precision, kind mm -hmm. of like our building versus buying. Right. And so it was like, okay, cool. There's a lot of different barrels out there. We got like a, one of these is Ballistic Advantage. I don't, this one, that, that one, there you go. And uh, we talked a little bit about them recently in a manufacturer review. And now it's come down to, okay, we've talked about velocities. Mm -hmm. We've talked about twist rates. We've talked about barrel lengths. we talked about gas lengths. What about the materials? Yeah. Just quite simply, the materials that the barrels are made out of. And honestly, I could just walk away now because you've got all this information in your brain housing group. So... <laughs> Tell us about the materials. All right, so yeah, um, you know, there's so many options out there, so many things, and like you said, when you're, especially when you look at building your own, yeah, uh, there's a lot to consider. So, first off, you know, when you look at the barrel material, there's basically uh, obviously it's steel. So right. let's just define steel real quick. Steel is iron alloyed with some other things, predominantly carbon, but other elements as well. So, for instance, 4140 is kind of the first type of steel we'll look at. That was mil spec for barrels made for the M1 Grand or the M14. Yeah. And very early commercial AR 15s, you sometimes you'll see a 4140 barrel. Now, it's not actually the right material as far as if you look at it from a mil spec perspective. Okay. But some barrel manufacturers, that's what they were used to working with. And so that's what they did. Uh, that's what they were using. Yeah. Now, that's got, you know, a 40% carbon. Uh, content, which mm -hmm. is the 40 at the end of 4140. And the 41 means that there is uh, chromium, and I hope I say this right, it's molybdium or something. It's the molly part of, there you go. Fair so, enough. <laughs> and so what these do is they give the strength uh, strength and, and like temperature resistance to the steel. Yeah. Uh, so 4140, uh, again, kind of early material, you don't really see it anymore. Uh, what we'd move on then to is 4150. Now. Yeah. Kind of an interesting fact that there was a little bit of a maybe a misconception that led to 4150 barrels. Uh, as people were getting more ARs in the market, they wanted what would be the current mil spec. Sure. And when they look at like a stat sheet, it says 4150, but there was some other information there. But I think out of misunderstanding, they're like, oh, 4150 steel, that's what I want. Yeah. So the difference there is a higher carbon content. That 50 at the end means there's actually you know about 10% more carbon, which means that it's uh, it's a harder material. Uh, on the one hand, that means that it's harder to machine, but on the other hand, it means that it's going to last longer. Right. Uh, so the thing is, again, that's not actually what the military used either. What the military used is what we would refer to commonly as chrome moly vanadium or CMV. Yeah. Right. Uh, it is written 41V50. So it is a 4150 steel, but has yeah. the addition of vanadium. Yep. And uh, basically that again helps increase like the strength of the material and especially that temperature resistance because the military is looking at they're making machine guns. Right. You and I are not making machine guns. Nudge. But uh, <laughs> they were making machine guns, and so they had to be able to withstand the temperatures of sustained automatic fire. Right. So that's why that vanadium was important. So you'll see it written on commercial specifications in a couple different ways. It might say 4150 CMV. Yeah. Uh, it might say 41V50. Uh, they sometimes just refer to it by the uh, kind of the specification sheet number for the mil spec, which is like a MILBI dash big number. Right. Uh, so those, uh, the 4150 
chrome moly vanadium is the mil spec material. That's what you would expect a military barrel to be made of. And it is what you see lots of barrels made of. So for instance, this one is clearly labeled uh, CRMOV, right. chrome moly vanadium. So I was just playing with the M4 to see if it had the CRMOV stamping or anything. Uh, didn't see that. Again, it's that clone series. So yep. they had different stampings probably Some to kind of, yeah, be accurate to the date. But yeah, but if you wanted to show that to the camera and explain exactly what all the nomenclature is there, that'd be cool. Sure, so we have a ballistic advantage marking followed by the caliber, 556 five, NATO. Uh, one and seven is the twist rate. Then the uh, CRMOV is chrome moly vanadium. So all the chemicals that go into making this that specific type of steel. Um, and then CL is chrome lined, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, and I believe that last part is just like a, a batch number or something. Gotcha. So something uh, where we talk about uh, I'm sorry, where they just identify where it came from, which batch. Uh, okay. But yeah, so, you know, twist rate, uh, you've done a whole video on twist rates before. Yeah, so twist rate, for those of you that don't know, it's quite simply how long the barrel, or the barrel, the projectile travels down the barrel before it makes one rotation. So for instance, the ballistic advantage barrel that we have here is a one in seven twist. Mm -hmm. That means that the bullet is making, or traveling seven inches down the barrel before it makes one complete rota rotation. Same thing with one in eight. It's true. One rotation for every eight inches, so one to 24, one to however, yeah. Being that it's that fast, one in seven is about the fastest AR barrel that you're gonna see. Yeah. Uh, it's it's gonna be perfect for heavier projectiles like match yeah. grade, something like a, you know 80 grains or so like that. Right. Um, the original M16 was actually a one in 12, 12. twist yeah. because it was specialized for that 55 grain bullet. Which I think it actually shows that on the M16, 12. Yep. Quite simply just the number 12 there, which means that's exactly what that is. And here's that M16 E1 clone, which I am a big fan of. Love the way that thing shoots. All right, so you know, again, so you have three types of carbon steel. Um, and basically, chromoly vanadium is the best one. So that's what you're going to look for. Uh, you would not want 4140 at all. 4150 is acceptable, though not as good as the chromoly. So finishing a uh, carbon mm -hmm. steel barrel is also very important. So uh, there's basically two main finishes that we talk about with carbon steel, which is pulverizing and melanating. Uh, that's also referred to as a uh, nitriding or, or phosphate. Yeah. Right, exactly. Okay. So phosphate or pulverizing uh, is a kind of porous finish. It does do very good about protecting it from temperatures, but really you still have to oil this uh, because since it is porous, you know, it does uh, not necessarily do the greatest job of protecting against corrosion rust by itself. Um, on the other hand, melaniding is not a coating per se. It's actually a chemical process that bonds with the steel of the, the surface of the steel and it increases the hardness dramatically. So this does a great job of, uh, you know, protecting it from corrosion. Also, a parkerized barrel, you would normally expect to have a, like, they're, they're also going to probably chrome line the inside. Yeah. For a melanited barrel, it's not going to chrome line. The melaniding does that, serves that purpose on the inside of the barrel itself because this raises it to, the hardest a dramatic amount like yeah. so when we talk about a carbon steel we're looking at you know possibly like 20 on the hardwell rockness scale uh like that 17-4 uh, yeah. goes up to like 44 which is already a significant increase right. this is like hardness 60. Oh, wow. so even without knowing anything about the scale itself you can just tell by the jump in size this is a much harder finish once it's you know they've uh, bonded to that surface steel um so yeah so That's this would also be a great protective coating uh for for temperature or corrosion. The next material we're gonna get into is the stainless steel. Now there are four types of stainless steel that you can expect to see AR barrels made out of. So it's not just stainless steel? It's not just stainless steel. So just like there were dis different designations for different kind of uh, specific alloys of carbon steel, yeah. stainless steel, there's 410 stainless steel, which is very hard, which makes it hard to machine. Yeah. Um, and you know, it does have good corrosion resistance though. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of stainless over carbon steel is so stainless steel is more corrosion resistant Right, uh, therefore it also usually has a higher hardness and therefore resists wear longer So you're gonna have a longer barrel life from a stainless barrel uh, for a Carbon steel obviously steel does rust and so therefore we have to do stuff to it to protect it Right, that's less important with a stainless steel barrel. You it's not to say you won't ever see a finish on a stainless barrel, right? But you don't have to put a finish on a stainless. Yeah, I was gonna make the joke too, but are all stainless steel stainless steel barrels so shiny? Uh, no, no. I mean, you you certainly could still put a finish on this, uh, yeah. but it's not as necessary just for protection of the barrel itself. Uh, so 416 stainless is a softer stainless, much easier to machine. But the problem is that 416 stainless also has a higher sulfur content, 
And so that does cause problems when you look at uh, the performance of the barrel. Uh, it can cause it to fail at really cold temperatures. If you shoot it below freezing, it has a significantly higher chance to fail mm -hmm. um, than say 410. But then uh, there's 416R, which you would think that being that's just a yeah. little letter designation different, they'd be pretty similar. Right. Uh, so that has that same molybdium. I'm gonna get that wrong every time, I think. <laughs> uh, this word uh, that's been added to the stainless and it helps uh, helps make it shoot at those lower temperatures much better. Uh, it is still uh, you know, a little bit easier to machine than the 410. Yeah. Uh, so it's got kind of a lot of the best of both worlds. Uh, that's cool. You know, being somewhat softer and easier to machine, but still having the ability to uh, have that higher uh, temperature resistance due to the molybdenum, uh, and you can shoot it down to lower temperatures down below zero. So the last stainless is 17-4 uh, pH, and okay. pH stands for precipitate hardening. So what's kind of funny, It's to me it's a little counterintuitive because it's saying that they create intentionally precipitates or small pockets of uh, kind of uh, impurities, like yeah. little pockets of those chemicals they add to the steel. Mm -hmm. And it actually helps to harden the steel overall. Oh, okay. And you would think normally that that would be considered a flaw, but in this case, it's an actual intentional thing that they've done to the steel. Uh, one of the great things about it is that it means that it, uh, it's much more temperature resistant than other stainlesses. Uh, it, this is considered like the cream of the crop when it comes to mm. stainless barrels. You would expect a barrel made of this material to be three to five times more expensive. Uh, the only real downside to it compared to other stainlesses is that it does not it doesn't withstand like high temperatures at a sustained temperature okay. very well. Um, so you know steels, all steels, carbon steels, stainless steels, they have to be hardened and tempered. So you know hardening, it's heated up to a very high temperature and then cooled rapidly. And then uh, to temper it, you bring it to a moderately high temperature and then let it sit and cool down slowly. And what that does is the first one hardens it and the second one helps to relieve stresses that may have formed in the metal where uh, things, uh, the grains in the metal kind of get moved around and this yeah. helps to relax them in a way. It helps so that if it comes under other stress, it doesn't just snap. Right. Uh, so the thing is with these 17-4 uh, pH, if it's at a sustained you know, temperature from say fully automatic fire, it can lose its temper uh, much more quickly and become just a soft piece of steel, in which case it becomes useless. Yeah, because then at that point, and if you guys have ever seen like a sustained fire, I'm always thinking machine guns, right? Yeah. Or when I think machine guns, I'm like, like the, the one that I think is probably the most prevalent is like the 249 saw. Mm -hmm. You've got a very fast projectile coming out of there, and if you just have it held down, a cyclic rate of fire just for as long as you can go, uh, you'll see that forbidden popsicle, you'll see that glowing red, and then what you'll finally start to see too are... Uh, if you continue to do this and it looks like that lightsaber, our projectile is just exiting the barrel before the muzzle. <laughs> uh, but before it gets to that point though, I mean, you really start to lose your accuracy because what's happening is that, that metal softens and heats up. I mean- And it starts flexing. And it starts flexing yeah. all over the place. So yeah, it becomes also very dangerous and uh, but a whole lot of fun. And uh, you guys should check it out. It's pretty cool to see. <laughs> Um, Especially in slow motion. But I don't think that, you know, as far as the uh, the issue with it lo losing its uh, tempering, you know, keep in mind that being that it is a much more expensive stainless steel, you're probably going to see the 17-4 pH mostly in like precision rifles. Yeah, super accurate. Uh, and you're not going to be shooting fully auto out of those. In fact, you probably aren't even semi-automatic with those type of rifles. Right. Um, so I don't think it's as much of an issue. So the last thing we can kind of talk about as far as materials go would be something like a carbon fiber barrel. Oh, um, yeah. Now, carbon fiber barrels have a steel sleeve so inside. It, so it's still technically a steel barrel, just carbon fiber wrapped. Right. Because I think that's one thing, like when we looked at like the uh, proof research mm -hmm. barrels, big fan of them, love them. Uh, and we've got one right here on the MTR rifle, which I love showing this off any chance I get. Uh, but anyway, so you'll look at this and some people are like, wow, a carbon fiber barrel. but. I can't imagine that a metal projectile would actually listen to what a carbon fiber barrel was telling it to do as far as it being twisted. That's because the barrel itself is not carbon fiber. It is carbon fiber wrapped. It still has that stainless, that or that steel at least, uh, core, the inner there. And, and you can see that here at the it. front of the barrel? Or yeah. Rear, I'm not sure, the but, chamber end of the barrel? Yeah. You can see this is metal back here. And then there is a thinner steel barrel that extends all the way through to right. the muzzle. 
And, and then in order to make up the bulk of the body of the barrel, it is then wrapped in the carbon fiber. So that gives you a lot of weight savings. Um, carbon fiber is very heat resistant. And so you're not gonna get the heat coming off of the barrel. Um, and of course, these are also very expensive. Uh, how much yes. was the barrel that you put into your AR build? $1,000. That's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that barrel is almost as expensive as my entire build. So, uh, but yeah, so fantastic barrels. Obviously, it still follows true with whatever other material was being used. So if it was a stainless uh, steel that was used in the construction of the barrel, it's still gonna follow those kind of same uh, uh, qualities we talked about with stainless steel. It's just going to be lighter weight because it's got less metal in it. Right, and then on top of that too, what's cool about the science behind the carbon fiber wrapped barrels are quite simply they're designed to not lose that accuracy over a period of time, but also to allow for better heat mitigation mm -hmm. and also weight deduction. So it's pretty neat. And if you check out Proof Research, there's a couple of others out there that use the same uh, type of idea. And again, it was one of those things where I'm like, man, I'm spending a lot of money. Don't know if I'm gonna get the same type of barrel life at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, no, we beat the crap out of these things and they run. Well, so it's pretty sweet. In, in relation to that, I mean, you gotta think that rifling isn't extremely deep, right? right? I mean, we're talking about something measuring thousandths of an inch. Right. And so, yes, there's a thin metal tube that forms the actual metal part of the barrel, but the, you know, if you wear through the rifling, that barrel shot out. Oh, yeah, it's, it's done. It's not like you have to wear through the entire thickness of the steel. No. So the fact that it's mostly carbon fiber wrapped around that steel barrel, yeah, you're going to get the same barrel life because yeah. it's the rifling part that counts. Speaking of rifling, I uh, would like to cover real quick how we get rifling into barrels. What? You just don't take a big old screwdriver and just... Zzz, you know, sort of. Kind drill. of. Um, well... So the cheapest uh, or most economical way to mm -hmm. rifle a barrel is what we call button rifling. Yeah. So the button is a bit, it's like a high strength carbide bit, and they basically just press it through the barrel and all the rifling is kind of formed in one go. Uh, it is also the roughest way because you're ending up by pressing something through a barrel that's already its final dimensions. Yeah. Uh, you're causing a lot of stress to the metal. Uh, the rifling itself can be somewhat rougher. So yeah. it is a way to make a barrel very quickly and inexpensively. And that's one way too that you might actually find a way to get more burrs and stuff like yeah, that too. Right. right. And, and that's what I meant when I said rougher. Yeah. Like yeah. it burrs and it peels a little. Uh, yeah. And granted, once you shoot a couple rounds to it, it might be just fine, but your first couple of shots probably aren't going to be that <laughs> accurate. But hey, that's why they say break your gun in, right? Yeah. I try. Uh, <laughs> so the, the next type of uh, way we manufacture rifling into a barrel is cut rifling. So cut rifling is probably the, also the oldest way we've got rifling. Uh, you can go all the way back to the earliest rifles and they cut rifling into those barrels uh, using a much more primitive version, but of basically the same process. You take a cutter and you run it down the barrel and it cuts just like a thousandth of an inch or even a fraction of that at a time. And so it has to be run many, many times and they use a machine, uh, a tool that will expand so that every time you run it through, you can expand a little bit more and expand a little bit more until it's cut that rifling into the barrel to the desired depth. Yeah, and it's very fine and very precise, which right. is very cool. If you ever look down like the rifling of a barrel, imagine the James Bond opening sequence. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it's not just one line being cut. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of them being cut over a period of time or a period of length, I should say, in the barrel. Because again, depending on how fast your twist rate is, might cause your twist to be faster mm -hmm. versus over a much longer length be a little bit slower. Right. And so, but you'll see a bunch of lands and grooves as they're called all the way through. It's not just one solid cut, right? I mean, so what's interesting is like the number of grooves that you see in rifling uh, does vary from rifle to rifle. Um, but like for instance, there's a reason why the Mosin Nagant was called a three line rifle because there are three grooves in the barrel. There you go. Um, but anyway, so the great thing about cut rifling is that it is a perfected technique. We've done this since the beginning of rifles. Uh, we, of course, use much better machines to cut it in a more accurate, quick sense than the f idea that they used to literally have to have like rope jigs wrapped over where you could pull yeah. things back and forth through the barrel. <laughs> right. But uh, having said that, it results in the best formation of rifling because you are individually cutting those grooves and it's, it's like a very precise way to do so. Um, so if you're looking for the most accurate rifle, uh, probably want to get a cut rifling uh, cut cut rifling barrel yeah. uh, 
the last way that we get rifling into a barrel is cold hammer forging. So this is kind of a cool process. The barrel starts out as a blank that's slightly oversized and they take a hardened mandrel. So again, like a tool made of carbide or something, and it has the rifling raised on that mandrel. So when they insert it into the bore and hammers come down and smash the outside of it, yeah. uh, it, it forms around that mandrel, which then has to be kind of screwed out of the barrel. And yeah. that is how the rifling's formed. Which is, again, I mean, when you think about how these barrels were made, we, when we toured Dana Defense, mm -hmm. they actually showed us the actual, the, the cold hammer forging, right. right? And you just got these massive hammers. Mm -hmm. Like when you think hammer, all like, oh yeah, a little like ding, ding, ding. No, these things are big, yeah. right? And it just beats the crap out like of this metal like to make it. it's a pneumatic hammer. It's not yeah. like a hand hammer. No, and it just has, and of course it's got water being sprayed on because when you have that much energy, that much Pressure friction. Pressure equals heat. Yep. Yes, I mean, you have to keep it cold. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, as it's just beating it, you see it just start to take form. And it's very cool how that works. So one of the great things about that is, and if you kind of remember, if we go back to like the uh, like milled versus forged AR lowers, uh, by using the hammers, the grain of the metal is actually running in line with the rifling. So as opposed to when you cut rifling, you know, you're actually removing metal so there's an interruption in the grain. Right. So that's another great benefit and it's why cold hammer forged barrels have the longest lifespan mm -hmm. when it comes to their rifling because that grain is running in the direction of the rifling, it's got the most strength in that regard. Uh, but like you're right, you, you'd have to do something to de-stress the metal because you're putting all kind of pressures on it as opposed to cut rifling you don't. Right. So, you know, basically if you're looking for the longest lasting barrel, I'd get a hammer cold hammer forged barrel. If you're looking for the most accurate, I would get a cut rifle barrel, but you're going to be needing to do a lot of work and using the best ammunition and have to care about the most precision yeah. for you to really notice some of those differences. Either one of them is a fantastic quality barrel. Right. Either one of them is probably going to be more accurate than most of the people shooting them anyway. Yep. Uh, so there's that. And uh, with that being said, if you had to select your primo material, your cut, whatever it is, what's the one that you would go for for one of your builds? <sighs> All right. So. If I was going to choose my like ideal barrel, uh, maybe like a, a 416R stainless, yeah. we're going to go ahead and apply an external coating because I don't want it to be bright and shiny. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, I would probably go with like cold hammer forged. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the cold hammer forging is yeah. just, it's so cool. And on top of that, it is providing or creating a very durable product to a right. very durable mm -hmm. part of your gun that's also very important part of your gun uh so for me yeah i'd probably go for the same type of thing cold hammer forged all the way all day <laughs> so uh getting into kind of like the last part i wanted to talk about barrels which is the finish you know we talked about mm -hmm. how stainless barrels don't need as much to protect them as carbon steel barrels do um so what are the things we do to carbon steel barrels and can also do to stainless steel barrels if we want to uh is first off chrome lining so chrome lining yeah has a benefit and a disadvantage. The idea is that it, it makes your rifle easier to clean. It helps create uh, resistance to corrosion. Uh, you'll see this a lot when we're talking about things like AK-47s because a lot of the surplus ammunition coming out of you know Eastern Europe is corrosive. You see it less often with ARs, but military ARs still have chrome parts, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if nothing else, uh, you know, it increases again your uh, corrosion resistance, but also it's harder than the steel. So it helps increase the lifespan a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, it does make it easy to clean uh, because it's slicker right. than the steel. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, you might be able to show that to the camera from your angle a little bit better. <sighs> don't know how well that'll pick up, but you can almost see like this outer ring that's much shinier compared to all the black right. that's inside of there. And what you're ultimately seeing there is that chrome lining. Right, so it's uh, usually across the chamber and then also down the bore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that is one option. But the downside to that is it does typically make a barrel less accurate. Um, you can expect up to, uh, say, a quarter MOA of lost potential accuracy. Yeah. I say potential that because, again, yeah. you're probably not accurate enough to necessarily notice the difference. Yeah. But I don't know you on an individual basis. Maybe we have some, some Olympic level shooters who are watching right now. I would like to think I do. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> you should hit us up if you're an Olympic level shooter. Come shoot yeah. with Clint. Yeah, and out shoot the hell out of me. Um, uh, but anyway, okay, cool. So you've covered a lot when it comes to barrels mm -hmm. and, I, and I really hope that this has answered some of y'all's questions uh, and if you've got them well fire away down in the comment section below where I'm sure we have a lot of people watching that may be one of those Olympic level shooters that you're talking about or you might simply just be an enthusiast who has a lot of experience with these or you might be in the metal industry uh, we've had people like that before like hey I'm actually one of the you know creators of one of these items and uh, yeah that's exactly how we do it and here's why we do it and stuff like that so if you're one of those people well comment down below too and offer even more information 
because uh, that's kind of what we want to build the channel around is, well, it's a lot of information, a lot of humor mm -hmm. uh, and pain if you're on our other channel. Uh, but anyway, so thank you because this answered some of my questions as well as, like I said before, I'm always tinkering with something. Oh, it's always fun to build another gun. Yes, it is. And so it's like, okay, cool. There are a lot of different barrels out there. There's a lot of different materials, a lot of different twist rates, lengths, and we're trying to cover all of that. So mm -hmm. if there's another specific item that you would like for us to cover, let us know down in the comment section below and well, we'll do just that. But with uh, anything else, was there any other final points you wanted to make or anything like that? Well, so to segue into our, our giveaway gun, uh, it has a sub MOA you know, uh, stainless steel barrel on it. So this is a 20 inch stainless steel barrel. And that is one of the great things about it that makes it such an accurate rifle is the fact that again, that stainless steel means that it's harder than carbon steel. It can uh, withstand the temperatures and it has the ability to, uh, to last longer. So this is going to increase your enjoyment out of your rifle if you are the winner because you're going to be able to shoot it for longer and shoot in all kinds of different conditions and get that high accuracy potential out of it. <laughs> Which also too, by the way, it can handle mag dumps just fine. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not shooting faster than a full auto, so it'll be just fine. But uh, anyway, this is our LWRCI Reaper Mark II, the Rapid Engagement Precision Rifle. As Matt was saying, this is a 20 inch 7.62 NATO rifle with the EOTech Voodoo three and a half to 18 power first focal plane optic, and also the Scalar Works mount, which I'm a big fan of. Does come with the Geisley two stage trigger, 20 round mag, the Magpul Precision Rifle stock, and all of the other awesomeness that you see here. And uh, Katie referred to this at the range as hefty. 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 So uh, with that being said, utilize the code word hefty to get yourself a couple hundred extra entries. It is uh, unloaded and without the optic, I think already 10 pounds. Mm. Uh, so as you can imagine, she's not wrong. Uh, this, this one time. But uh, anyway, with that being said, again, head on over to classicfirearms.com to get your entries for this giveaway, but also do to check out all of the different products that we have to offer that uh, might be right up your alley for all of your Second Amendment need, wants, joys, gifts, builds, whatever it could be, we probably got it. So we'll leave it off there, guys. Uh, we'll see you down in the comments section. If you have any questions about barrels or any other type of gun stuff, let us know. As always, we appreciate you and your business. God bless. And we'll see you next time at classicfirearms.com. This is Ambi, by the way. Did you know that? Yeah, I saw that when I was doing my video.